Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, Working Together to Create a More Resilient Community. The fourth in the series is about prevention, school and community-based beginning with efforts to ensure our children, schools, families, and communities have the skills, programs, and support they need to thrive. In this segment, host Ed Baker talks with guests about the Opioid Coordination Council strategy to promote a comprehensive statewide approach to school and community-based prevention, statewide prevention messaging, and effective opioid education for healthcare providers and consumers. Hi everybody, welcome to our show. My name is Ed Baker and I am the host of Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis. Thank you, Jalinda, for your introduction. As Jalinda mentioned, the focus of today's program will be prevention. The prevention efforts that Vermont has uh, begun as a result of Governor Scott's uh, initiative of 2017 and the Opioid Coordinations, uh, Coordination Council's work uh, since then. In order to help us understand um, prevention efforts in Vermont, I have three distinguished guests with me today. Mariah Sanderson, who is the director of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community, Ann Gilbert, who is the director of Central Vermont New Directions, and Christine Lloyd Newberry, who is the director of Integrated wellness program at Champlain Valley School District. I figured we would just jump right in and I'd have you mm -hmm. all introduce yourselves and speak a little bit about your passion for this work. Mm -hmm. I'm Ann Gilbert and I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition in Montpelier, serving all of Washington County. And um, I'm passionate about prevention because we do see that it works. I've been working in the field for um, almost 15 years uh, as a parent educator through the Family Center and running after-school programs 
and now the director of the coalition with funding for preventing tobacco use and alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs. So. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm Mariah Sanderson. I'm the director of the Burlington Partnership for Healthy Communities. So our coalition has been around for about 10 years. I've been the director for all that time, um, looking at um, how to address the causes and consequences of substance abuse in Burlington. Um, and we do that really by looking at strategies that are about changing the environment that people live in. Um, so we're looking at changes to policy and practice, uh, public awareness and education components. Um, we're looking at, uh, we are implementing programs for youth around youth empowerment and leadership to ha help them have a positive change and influence on their community. Um, and then we've also recently started doing some parent education work as well. Um, and uh, so I've been doing this for about 10 years and then prior to that I worked in the treatment and recovery field. Um, so I uh, kind of saw the um, the struggles that folks were going through and when I had my own kids really wanted to be on the other end of that thinking about how do we help support people to make healthy choices from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Christine Lloyd Newberry and I am the Director of Integrated Wellness for Champlain Valley School District. Uh, for the seven years prior to that I was the Executive Director of Connecting Youth which is the Community Prevention Coalition in the same region of the state. Uh, my passion for this is personal and, pro and professional. Um, I started uh, as a high school student in prevention programs very, very early on uh, here in the state of Vermont. Uh, and so I've sort of seen the, the whole arc of, of prevention over the lifespan um, here in our state and what has worked uh, and some of what hasn't. I am also, like Mariah said, a parent, and so this has that much more meaning for me. In the school district, we really focus on how do we create a community for our students that enables them to not only make healthy choices, um, but supports them in doing that. We talk a lot about resilience, um, so we'll probably talk some today about adverse childhood experiences, but the truth is, whether you're in a school or in the community, you're a parent, you're an educator, or just a community member, everybody has a role in supporting kids in our communities and so that's really the lens that we try to look at um, look at all of this through thank you thank you so much mm -hmm. you know the subtitle uh, for the show is working together to create a more resilient mm -hmm. uh, community mm -hmm. and I can't think of three people that more exemplify that that sentiment so thank you for your work and thank you mm -hmm. for your dedication you know for the viewing audience I thought it would be good to just begin at the beginning, mm -hmm. was just a, a thumbnail definition of what, what exactly is prevention. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw that out to the, to the panel. Well, I think I'll just jump in and say there's, um, there's a lot of different ways that people define prevention. Um, so I'll say that for the organization I work with and some of the work that we're doing at a county level and a city level, um, we're define, uh, defining it um, the way that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration does, um, which is to say we're looking at um, prior to the onset of a disorder, how do you support people to not develop an addiction or dependence? Um, so we're really looking at what are the community um, the community initiatives we can be doing, the school-based initiatives we can be doing, the individual supports for folks that really help them to make healthy choices and make the healthy choice the easy choice um, prior to them developing uh, to make a problem. The, to make the healthy choice the easy choice, music to my ears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, chime in with anything or is that do you want to add something to that? Well, prevention is really stopping something before it starts. Mm -hmm. And many times, unfortunately, but fortunately, we learn from experience. Mm -hmm. You know, when there were lots of kids with head injuries, we decided, you know, as a country, we, we need bike helmets, yeah. you know, and ski helmets, um, uh, seat belts. And so we're really looking at what are those things that can really help mm -hmm our youth and our families now mm -hmm. in preventing substance use disorders. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You want to add something? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty comprehensive. Great, great, great definition. And um, from there, I guess I'd like to go to the um, 
the Youth Risk Behavior um, Report of 2017, mm -hmm. yeah. just issued in May of 2018, which there is a, like a resounding um, example of prevention mm -hmm. on, this, on this report, uh, specifically with regard to cigarettes, mm -hmm. that Vermont has reached its goal, the um, Healthy Vermonters uh, 2020 goal, was to reduce cigarette smoking amongst high school age students by 10%, mm -hmm. and we've surpassed that. In 2007, there were 18% of high school students using cigarettes. In 2017, there are 9%. Mm -hmm. So a full 10% of students, or full 9%, but less than 10% of students are now not initiating smoking. Mm -hmm. This is an incredible success. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to maybe, because you've been around, you've been doing this work all through this period, mm -hmm. I'd like to speak a little bit about, or you to speak a little bit, to what worked about that. What is it that worked so well about that? If it's okay, maybe even before we do that, for folks who aren't familiar, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey mm -hmm. is a survey we do in Vermont um, every two years. We've been doing it for over 20 years mm -hmm. now, so we have a really good data set. Um, and all public schools in Vermont take it, um, all students in all public schools in Vermont take it, so it's a really large sample. Um, and the results for um, for 2017 just came out last week, so all we have right mm -hmm. now are our statewide results. Um, but we will eventually also have um, individual county level results and school district level results. So it's a great way for school districts or communities to look at what are the challenges that you're seeing and what are the successes and use data to help you build on. Just to speak successes. to the magnitude mm -hmm. of that, it was approximately 21,000 Vermont high school students mm -hmm representing 69 schools were, were interviewed. So this is a comprehensive It's study. middle school and high school level yeah. every two years. And the public can access this information on the Vermont Department of Health website mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, like Mariah said, we don't have the specific um, supervisory union data just yet. Mm -hmm. And it's also a national survey. It's, it's a well-validated tool created by the CDC. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can actually compare Vermont to other states across the mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. um, who are taking the same survey. There are a handful of questions uh, across states that are going to be different, but the core set of questions is the same. So we can compare our progress to other states and maybe learn from someone that's doing a little yes. better or maybe teach someone that needs to, Absolutely. that we're doing right. better than. Yeah. But we are excited about the tobacco use going yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, what, what are those things that have worked? Well, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before we yeah. all got together, is that um, we really, I think, with um, when it comes to tobacco use prevention, the master settlement dollars that our state received, which is uh, when the, t in, um, I think it was 1988, is it? Um, the, our state, along with a bunch of other states, sued the tobacco industry for lying to the public about the health impact of tobacco smoking and got a large settlement that we received every year. And we put some of that money back into doing, uh, helping people quit and then also preventing new users. So we've um, been doing that for a long time, which is why we've really invested in tobacco prevention in our state. And you've seen some drastic results, both in youth, um, the youth data, but also for adults too. So the adult yeah. use rates have gone down significantly over the last 50 years as well. Um, and it was, we took a comprehensive approach. So we, we did public education. Like I think right now I would say we've probably vilified smoking, right? Like it's no longer <laughs> cool to smoke. It's yeah. very, um, it's gotten to the point where um, um, you feel a little ostracized if you're smoking. Um, and that is a result of a lot of the public education that was done. Um, we also changed a lot of policies. So back when my um, mom was uh, ha having me in the hospital, sh if she wanted to, she could have smoked in her hospital bedroom, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. right? That, no, now, today, we would go, that's awful, right? <laughs> we don't want to see that yeah, happening. Like a visceral but, response. Right, like, oh. right. Yeah. yeah, and people did. Mm -hmm. um, but we've changed a lot of those policies, right? So because we, we, because we mm -hmm. realized the health impact and also it was to help people quit. So we made it a lot harder to smoke. There's public smoking bans. There's, um, you can't smoke in most places inside. And other states are not the same as Vermont. So Vermont, there's no public smoking inside. Um, but in some other states you still can. So we've seen 
better results in other states as a result of that. Um, and we increased the taxes, so it made it harder for people to, um, or more incentive for folks to quit, essentially. Right, yeah, <laughs> and incentive. harder for kids sure. to start. So we know that price is really determines whether kids will use or not too, because they don't have the unlimited income like adults do. So, mm -hmm. um, so price really impacts kids' use. There's also been some like effective universal preventive uh, messaging on TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people that people suffering from the consequences of uh, right. cancer of the mouth, cancer of the lungs on right. TV, talking about this is a result of smoking or chewing tobacco. We did a Very lot effective. of public education, right? So there are those messages, that, but there's also the absence of the other advertising. When I was growing up, right. there were always jingles and commercials on TV and the radio promoting cigarettes, yeah. and there were cigarette machines, and they were cheap, and kids could even buy them, and they were everywhere. And so getting rid of all of that has made a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And even as a parent of an adolescent, mm -hmm. showing him movies that I watched as a teenager in uh -huh. the 80s, um, I'm amazed to see the prevalence of smoking and alcohol use in mm -hmm. movies you, um, that were common for teenagers to be watching. Also we don't see that anymore. Newscasters, mm -hmm. I can remember when I was a kid, Santa Claus had a carton of Lucky Strike cigarettes sticking mm -hmm. out of his mm -hmm. gift bag, mm -hmm. so it was normalized. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. We know that having all of that and kids seeing it all the time normalizes use and it makes it more likely that they'll pick up a substance. So that was part of a comprehensive plan to, to really reduce tobacco use rates. We've looked at all of those things that were impacting use rates and, and tried to make, um, make it easier to make a healthy choice. And as it pertains to youth, one of the things that we learned very clearly as a part of the, the tobacco um, settlement process uh, and all of the science and research that came out of that time period was the longer that you can delay onset, the less mm. likely somebody is to pick yeah. up. Yeah. Um, in their 20s, somebody's not going to start smoking. Um, the tobacco industry is very, very aware that their new smokers are teenagers. Um, and so the earlier they can, can convince somebody to start smoking, the more likely they are to develop um, an addiction over time. Yeah, and the, the brain research, I think we had discussed this mm -hmm. a little bit, the brain research on brain development. Mm -hmm. In the 20s, the prefrontal cortex, where people make decisions based on rewards and consequences, is fully developed. Whereas in adolescence, kids are more impulsive, so they make quick decisions mm -hmm. and sometimes with terrible uh, consequences. Right. So there's it seems, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say there's um, a lot of uh, good data that shows that um, Ninety percent of folks who develop an addiction started before they were 18. Yeah. So really, know if you can delay yeah. just a little bit longer, yeah. we really can make a lot of changes in terms of prevention. Yeah. We can really figure out the strategies that help us delay people using while they're in their teens and early 20s. And, and speaking to that, mm -hmm. that's why we work with college campuses and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. universities who are now going smoke free. Uh, or tobacco free. There are over 1,600 in the nation wow. and uh, many in Vermont which wow. are now smoke free campuses so that if kids have not smoked in high school as we see on the YRVS and they're entering college if they're not in a smoking environment they're less likely to start. Right. Yeah. Beautiful, that's real progress. Yeah. Mm. So it looks like we have some clear indicators about how to go and where to go. There's reason for concern with the youth risk behavior uh, report of 2017, specifically with regards to alcohol and marijuana. Mm -hmm. Alcohol use had decreased from 2007 to 2015 by 12%. It's a profound decrease. Mm -hmm. But between 2015 and 2017, it actually increased mm -hmm. by a significant amount, 3%. Same with marijuana. Mm -hmm. Marijuana had gone from 24 to 22 percent in from 2007 to 2015, and then that same period, 2015 to 2017, we lost fully two percent, so another significant rise. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? That cigarettes had a continuous downward trend, but alcohol and marijuana have now, over the past two years, mm -hmm. uh, trended upwards. <coughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> One of the things um, that really stands out to me as it relates to this is with tobacco, we really changed um, policy uh, around tobacco. 
We had long-term sustained efforts that changed um, access to tobacco f among youth. Mm -hmm. um, it changed where people are, are permitted to use. Um, so the how, when, the whole community environment around tobacco use um, was re has really been solidified. With alcohol, we're still involved in that process, um, and we're still working on on making all of those changes. So we, as we talk about um, restricting use for youth uh, in our school district, one of the things that we focus on is uh, locking alcohol up in the home, mm -hmm. um, making alcohol inaccessible to youth. We know that uh, younger students who have access in the home, they're getting, they're not getting it from a friend. They're getting it from the, their liquor cabinet, the refrigerator in the house, um, or from the home, from the home of a friend, um, as opposed to somebody purchasing alcohol for them. So looking at things like that. Um, would you add to that, Mariah or Anne? Um, yeah, and, and there are things that we are doing in communities, you know, um, restricting sale to minors. But we really do need to have that message publicly. Um, you know, like Christine said, with tobacco, there was so much less familiarity with it, you know, and exposure to it. But with all the media and um, yeah. I think the, the kids are looking to their parents and to policymakers and to the community to offer healthy solutions for them and to keep them safe. And when they see, uh, you know, legalization um, or uh, still a lot of promotion of alcohol and of tobacco uh, and of marijuana, um, they're not getting that message that, that it's harmful. And so they have this uh, decreased perception of harm and that's something that we're really trying to change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I wondered about that. When you look at protective factors, mm -hmm. and a few of them are the adolescent's perception of risk. Mm -hmm. As the perception of risk increases, the willingness to use decreases. Mm -hmm. a parental attitudes toward mm -hmm. a substance or another, mm -hmm. parental use mm -hmm. of a substance or another, or mm -hmm. the community attitude. It seems to me that, that this is a clear warning shot now marijuana and alcohol we you know we've begun to lose a little bit of ground mm -hmm. so we have to begin to you know really increase our efforts to educate children and and parents it seems that parents mm -hmm. really are are crucial or if not parents trusted adults in mm -hmm. children's lives would you like to speak about that a little bit mm -hmm. yeah I mean I can say I think again um, as much as all of the different places where kids are being influenced can reinforce the same message, the more likely kids are to make healthy decisions. So adults in the community, we are one of the key factors for kids doing well, right? And how much we reinforce healthy decision making and role model appropriate use um, really matters. Um, so, you know, just I'm thinking of, you know, in my own peer group, oftentimes uh, I'll hear adults refer to alcohol as a way to relax. We're talking about like, I really need a drink at the end of the day. But those types of things are the, if you think about it, kind of the opposite of what we want to teach kids. You don't want kids to think of drugs and alcohol as a way to help them manage emotions or manage stress. Right. Um, so us reinforcing those messages really can be harmful for them. Um, and I'll take us back a little bit to your previous question because I wanted to add, I think one of the things that was really successful with our tobacco efforts in our state, honestly, is the money that went into it. Mm -hmm. So we as a state decided, you know, this costs us money. Like tobacco use is um, still, um, I think it was the last I looked, it was like $350 million is what we spend as a state every year to address um, kind of the health related consequences that come from our current tobacco smokers. It's a significant impact on our state budget. Um, so we, you know, we put money into tobacco prevention and cessation because we know it was an investment to support reducing that cost. 
We haven't necessarily done the same yet with um, addressing other substance use challenges, um, and we also didn't, you know, the tobacco settlement money gave us the opportunity to do that, so there's, you know, there's different, um, there's challenges with that, but um, one of the reasons there's a lot of reasons why we could have seen an increase in some of the, in the marijuana and alcohol use, but um, one of them could potentially be is that we've actually we lost some funding over the last few years that was going into prevention, and our state funding f to support our, well, our, it's mostly comes from the federal government. Our funding to support substance abuse prevention kind of goes up and down mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. and so that like inconsistency of being able to address a problem and be really targeted. Um, has been a challenge and it will make our numbers kind of go, uh, us have a hard time making consistent progress. Um, and so I think maybe our coming together isn't the place to address that challenge, but, um, but for communities that are thinking about what do we do about that or families that are thinking about that, really as much as communities can think about how to make cha changes or individuals or parents can think about how they make changes that don't need the kind of support from programs, um, so that changes, that like changes in the home, oh, changes in the home, changes, changes to policy at a community interact. level. Yeah. You yeah. At, like as a, at a as a town, you can make a lot of changes mm -hmm. that don't require, um, you know, additional funding to policy and practice. Um, so as much as we can think about how does how do we help both all the environments support kids to make healthy choices. Mm -hmm. you, you you shed light on one of my fondest hopes uh, that from 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 the current situation. This idea of funding up and down and not being consistent over time, mm -hmm. I, I do think that that day is over. And the reason I think that is because of the gravity and the velocity mm -hmm. of the opioid crisis in Vermont and in America. Mm -hmm. I think it has grabbed the, the public's attention like never before. Mm -hmm. And there's a groundswell of compassion and a groundswell of effort. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the governor's uh, opioid uh, coordination commission mm -hmm. and the governor's policies you know, we'll, we'll really grab onto that in a substantial way. Mm -hmm. And we'll have uh, a, a permanent mm -hmm. sea change mm -hmm. in the way we operate so that generations of the future will not have to see this again. And I, I guess what I'm hearing from you is one of the many things I'm hearing from you is the importance of partnerships, mm -hmm. that this is an all-hands-on-deck effort. Mm -hmm. And I'd like, I'd like the panel to address that. Like, how do you develop partnerships, and who do you see as your, 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 your partners in this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly in addressing prescription drugs, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to see even more education in the schools from an early, early age, because we know that kids have been you know, uh, poisoned teenagers or getting them from the medicine cabinet at home and educating parents about what they can do to provide um, uh, safe use, safe monitoring yeah. of prescriptions at home um, and then safe disposal. We're working with hospitals and um, doctor's offices. You know, the, the supply, they're, they're not supplying as many pills as they used to we, because we saw that that was such a problem. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so now one of the things that I'm addressing in uh, uh, central Vermont, in Washington County, is the safe disposal. Mm -hmm. So we've put um, a kiosk, uh, a safe collection box, in every police station and in the Washington County Sheriff's Department. So anybody can go in when the um, police station is open and just put their old medications, get them out of the home, you know, not keep them around if they've had a shoulder injury or their, their child had their wisdom <coughs> teeth uh, extracted. Get rid of those old medications. Don't save them for that rainy yeah, day. Really you can important. take them to the police station or we've just um, gotten some grant funding <coughs> for some of the pharmacies to get a kiosk um, to have one there. So when people are going to do their drugstore shopping or pick up a new prescription, they can get rid of their old ones. We also are working with the Vermont Department of Health to um, uh, supply these mailers to communities, which is um, postage paid. People can just cross off the name on their prescription bottle, put it in the envelope, seal it up, and drop it in a 
um, a mailbox or take it to the post office. Yeah, that is encouraging. And mm -hmm. um, so the campaign that the Vermont Department of Health is running is called Vermont's Most Dangerous Leftovers. And this is really trying to get the word out that we don't want these old prescriptions sitting around. Mm -hmm. So we can reduce the access and reduce the use. Yeah. Along, along those lines, yeah. uh, reducing supply, mm -hmm. there was uh, a recent report of the Vermont Prescription Monitoring System. Mm -hmm. Vermont, the percent of Vermont population receiving at least one opioid prescription in January of 2016 was 6.9%. Mm -hmm. In two years, mm -hmm. it's been reduced to 4.9%, mm -hmm. down 2% mm -hmm. in two years. That is a profound reduction. That's prescribers mm -hmm. being educated about the dangers of prescribing opioids for chronic pain, mm -hmm. really reducing the supply. That is a wonderful mm -hmm. example that you give. Mm -hmm. what, what about other partnerships mm -hmm. that you find important in the community? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the beauty of prevention, from my perspective, is that yeah. everybody has the opportunity to be a partner in this work. So while we have professionals that we partner with very closely, uh, with other community organizations and physicians and hospitals, like Anne was saying, parents, um, but it really is, it needs to be an entire community effort. We all need to be um, providing support and offering the same messaging, um, not only to youth, but to the community as a whole. Um, this is, isn't just a, a focus on preventing kids from using or trusting kids and making the healthy choice. It's really about changing the mm -hmm. dynamic of the community so that, the, that, that there's, almost so that there's not a decision point to be had because, because the problem has been contained. If that makes sense. That's yeah, changing around what, what people think, what people believe, how they act, how they interact, how they educate their children, and the opportunity for mm -hmm. drugs. Right. You just can't control the opportunity. You have to right. control people's motivation also, or, or impact people's motivation. Mm -hmm. So there's so uh, the organization I work for is uh, Community Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, which means that we try to engage um, a variety of sectors around the table to solve a problem, essentially. And there's coalitions like Anne's uh, also works in this similar model. Um, there's coalitions like ours across the state that are doing that work. Um, that are bringing together different sectors of the community, whether it's education, law enforcement, businesses, sometimes media representatives, parents, youth, to try to say, okay, what are we gonna do about this community challenge? And that model is one that, um, that's that been replicated across the country, that it really does require a variety of sectors to work together to make community change. Um, so I, you know, I would encourage communities to either get involved in your local coalition if your community has one, or if they don't, to think about how maybe you could start one. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the way that groups like that um, who have done good work in Vermont work is that they look at what are um, kind of doing some data analysis, what are the problems in the community, assessing what are the community needs, and then figuring out okay, what are the strategies that we're going to take to to do something about that, um, and that model works really well because it does kind of force all these different sectors yeah. to participate and to yeah. um, to reinforce the same yeah. messages. So the more moving parts moving together in a unified way, the more likely the the success. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, a little bit of that, and also that like re everyone's kind of involved in sometimes making a large community change requires a lot of different people to be invested, mm -hmm. essentially. So um, it kind of makes, it gets everybody involved in making the changes that are necessary. And we talk about that as community buy-in. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, community buy-in. Community buy-in. Yeah. You know, if, if everybody has a little bit of skin in the game, they're yeah. that much more invested in making it work. Mm -hmm. Get in the game. <laughs> I, like it. I call it all hands on deck. Same thing, same yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's really children in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's our children that are really, really at risk here. It's, every, it's, all, it's all our children. And um, th that to me, did you, did I interrupt you? Well, they are our children. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. those children want to grow up and be very autonomous and independent. And they kind of don't want any more help from their parents, yeah. you know, which is a natural stage to go through. But my message to parents is really to just continue to be the parent 
even when it's hard. It's mm -hmm. not your job to be their best friend. Mm -hmm. And those kids, they want to go to a party or they want to stay home alone or they want to have friends over. And there have to be really clear guidelines and clear rules and then consequences um, for any kind of behavior that would, that, that would go on. And even for parents to partner with um, other parents in the community it's hard, you know, to really put yourself out there and make a phone call or, um, you know, become a Facebook friend with some other parent, you know, of your kid's friends. But um, I really encourage them to do that so that you find out, you know, my kids said they're going to a party at your house. Are you yeah. going to be home? Yeah. What are you going to do? Is it going to be supervised? What's happening? You know, and just like when kids are younger, you know, do you have guns in the house? Maybe now you have to talk about, well, what's your policy around alcohol? Or, you know, we don't allow our kid to be drinking until they're 21, and we don't want them to be around marijuana right now. And I yeah. think we had, we had touched on that a little bit earlier, that part of the reluctance for people to really talk about this is the stigma mm. attached to it. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a, sh a shame and a, you know, a shadowy kind of a feeling about talking about substances. Mm -hmm. When, when you have a toddler, mm -hmm. you don't hesitate to, to tell the toddler the dangers of putting a sharp object in their mouth or yeah. something that's non-edible. Yeah. Why, why, do why do parents hesitate really to talk to their children about substance use? Mm -hmm. It's because of stigma and hesitation. What are we, what are we doing? What are your groups uh, doing about, about stigma, about reducing stigma in Vermont? So, um, in our community, um, we're, we started a parent education program called Parent In, um, which is really just, uh, it's called Parent In Burlington, and it's really about helping parents think early about how to prepare and get your, yourself and your kids ready for the challenges that come later. So oftentimes I think what happens for parents is that we, we wait until there's a problem mm -hmm. to do something about it, right? Like we wait until we see our kids struggling, or we wait... Um, until there's been a party and our kid comes home drunk and then we figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, and the, the parents who've been the most successful or the communities that have been the most successful have learned how to start having those conversations early so that when your kid is presented with that situation, they already know what their answer is going to be. They've already thought about it. They've already prepared. They've already practiced how to say no. Um, if, if the first time that they experience someone offers them a drink or offers them cannabis or mm -hmm. offers them a pill um, is the first time they've thought about it, they're more likely to say yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're really trying to help parents think about even when it feels like your kid is too young. I mean, I have a, a almost 11 year old and a 13 year old and, and it makes me feel, I don't love talking to them about this stuff either because um, I don't want to take away their innocence, right? Like you feel like you're taking, every time you have these conversations, mm -hmm. you think you feel like you're taking a little bit away of their innocence, but, but I also want them to be prepared and I don't want them to feel, um, to not know what to do when they encounter situations. So, so I think the more we can talk about it, the better. Um, and the more we can provide a community for parents to talk about it the, together, the better. So that's why we created this um, Parent Inn, which is um, for uh, parents to kind of create their own communities so that they can talk to each other about things um, and also um, feel, if you start to, if you start to create um, a community where you feel comfortable with each other, then you can, uh, you're more likely to have those uncomfortable conversations or those challenging conversations where you might have to ask another parent, hey, I just want to make sure that you are keep, you know, we're, we're legalizing marijuana in um, the state as of July 1. People will be allowed to have marijuana in their homes. So, you, so we're going to need to go to other parents and say, hey, I want to make sure, do you have marijuana in your home? Is it locked up? Mm -hmm. You know, right. can my kid right. get access to it? Those right. are uncomfortable mm -hmm. conversations we're going to have to have. Mm -hmm. So if you can create a community where you already feel comfortable with the other parents, yeah. it's much easier yeah. to have those conversations. Yeah. <laughs> and the beauty of this campaign, so we're running the same, um, the same program in our district as well. And one of the beauties of this is, is these are all local families who are highlighted in the nice. program, which really creates that community. Mm -hmm. um, and we're highlighting families who are doing the right thing, mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. 
engaged. Um, and I wanted to go back to something that Ann said. One of the beautiful things about talking early and often to your kid is that we know well into old, older adolescence that parents are the number one influence on their students' decisions around substances. And so even when they're slamming their door and stomping their feet and rolling their eyes and huffing at you, um, they're hearing what you're saying. You're not going to get the feedback that's, from them. That's proof they're hearing it. Right. <laughs> and it's and not only are they hearing it, but they're taking it in and it's sinking in. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, even when you feel like they're, you're making no headway, know that that saying it over and over again is actually you're getting somewhere. Yeah, because and the younger the kids are, the easier it is, really. You know, I mean, 10 and 11 year olds are more open to learning about this and wanting to follow the rules. And if you start early, then it's not this very difficult, yeah. you know, conversation that you might have with a middle schooler or high school or even college. And and you you really need to continue to have these conversations right through college. And to, and to normalize that, yes. to seize the moment. Yeah. Seize the moment, have a conversation at an age-appropriate level. Yeah. The conversation may be different for a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old. Right. But go to parent and figure out what's the direct, what's the best approach, yes. and have that those conversations yeah. with your children. I had um, Brendan Del Pozo, the police mm -hmm. chief, was, mm -hmm. was on my show, and he has two young children, mm -hmm. and he talked about that. Mm -hmm. He talked about being on a hike, mm -hmm. beautiful hike in Vermont on a beautiful uh -huh. day, mm -hmm. and kind of debating about whether or not to bring this topic up. Uh -huh. You know, it's a beautiful day. Why do I want to bring this up? But he, bring, he brings it up to normalize it. Mm -hmm. Bring it up, have the conversation, the conversation's over, continue with the day. Until the next time mm -hmm. that the moment is there. Yeah. And that way, it's, a, it's not an unfamiliar taboo, right. stigma yeah. topic. It's something that we just discuss. It's part of, part of life. And it's and not a one-time, oh, excuse me, it's not right. a one-time long lecture either. Right. It's just right. these right. little snippets that right. you want to keep getting in there. Yeah. 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 It's the moment in the car when you hear the local head shop commercial <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Or, or you're hearing an advertising for uh, a local vape shop and the variety of flavors they yeah. have for their e-cigarettes and jewels. Yeah. Um, and so it creates an opportunity. Those for me as a parent are the time as I'm turning the radio off because I don't want to hear it mm -hmm. to say to my 15 year old, mm -hmm. who do you think that's for? Do yeah. you do you think I'm looking for cotton candy right, right. flavored? Didn't someone have a jewel? Do we have that? Yes, we do. Want to show that? Yes, and this has been such a problem in all of the schools right now. Um, this uh, electronic cigarette vape vaping device, which is easily concealable, and you know it can it just uh, charges uh, in your laptop. Uh, it's battery operated. I was just going to say, it looks like I want to put it in my MacBook. <laughs> well, yeah, that's so parents don't them. even know if uh, this is in their kid's backpack or if it's in their room. They think it's a flash drive, mm -hmm. and um, so they don't know. And what's really um, unfortunate is, yes, just as all of the smoking rates, cigarette smoking rates are going down, mm -hmm. using... Um, um, electronic nicotine systems, mm -hmm. um, vaping devices or e-cigarettes is really on the rise yeah. and what we found is that most kids don't know that there are nicotine in the, that there's nicotine in this which is so harmful to the developing brain um, yeah. and young yeah. kids and they also don't know about the dangerous chemicals that are in the flavors. I mean there are thousands of different flavors of um, e-juice that you can put in these. And um, they're really um, uh, appealing to kids. And But those flavors in there were meant maybe for food consumption, but never to be ingested or um, inhaled or heated. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and I think we talked about that a little bit earlier, yeah. like the marketing power mm. yeah. of the corporations that uh, manufacture these mm -hmm. things. I mean, we've seen that with opioid pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies developing opioids in the marketing in the 90s and the early 2000s yeah. and what it's led to today. Mm -hmm. This is just, you know, the latest iteration mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. These companies, some of them are losing so much money because we're being successful with cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So they come up with a product like mm -hmm. this that's aggressively marketed mm -hmm. to children, although it's disguised. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and then yeah, and I mean, our it's children that are same, being exposed to that. It's that same thing we talked about earlier with the earlier you can get somebody to start, the more likely they are to develop an addiction. And so um, companies know that as well. Mm -hmm. um, they know, and they know that that's how they'll make their money, right? Is that um, the the more like the more often people use, the more money they make. And so there is a there is a business model that that kind of supports getting people to use more often. So we as community members and as adults really need to think about how do we delay kids from using. The longer we can delay, the better. The longer we can, if we can get someone to not use until after they're 21, which is, you know, really ideally what we do at, for any substance, most likely they will never pick up an addiction, <coughs> right? Um, and, you know, I wanted to add to our earlier conversation for parents is, um, you know, Talking early and often is really important for your kids, but it's also important that if you're if you have any concerns that your kid might have a problem, mm. or might have might have uh, you know m might be struggling either with dependence or using more often, get help right away. Absolutely. Like the earlier mm -hmm. you can intervene, the better. Um, even if you're not really sure what's going on and you're confused, there's a lot of wonderful organizations that help support um, parents of adolescents. Um, and I've never, I've never experienced a parent who said, I wish I had waited longer to oh, intervene, right? Like absolutely. they all, almost every parent whose child is, is going through a, a, a problem with addiction right now said, I wish I had intervened earlier. I wish I had taken them to treatment earlier. So that, that piece of like, as a parent not wanting to admit that there's a problem we have to let go of and you have to kind of intervene as soon as you're worried. Mm -hmm. I can't even reinforce that uh, strongly enough, that the longer a person hesitates, mm -hmm. the more time the addiction mm -hmm. has to take hold right. like on a neuronal level mm -hmm. in the brain. And again, that that's, speaks a little to stigma. Mm -hmm. No parent wants to think that their child is using substances. Mm -hmm. right. No parent wants to admit, mm -hmm. and that's largely to do with stigma. If your parent has mumps or measles or chicken pox or some mm -hmm. pneumonia mm -hmm. or something, you go to the doctor and you get help and it's just a matter of course, okay, we're better. Yeah. Yeah. With substance use, it's a little bit different. And that, again, you know, comes to us, our responsibility is to reduce uh, that, that stigma. I think, speaking to that, I think that you had some um, information regarding messaging, preventive prevention messaging on a universal uh, level. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Well, actually, so Anne brought um, a little information oh, about Parent Up, which mm -hmm. is the uh, campaign here in Vermont that parents can access. If you go to parentupvt.org, mm -hmm. parentupvt.org is the website. It's a great website that Vermont has for parents um, that can help you with um, kind of what are the different um, supports that help support your kids to make healthy choices, but also to identify when your kid might have a problem. Mm -hmm. So there's a por portion of the website that says like, are you concerned about X, Y, or Z? Mm -hmm. And those are for families who are going there because they are a little worried that something might be wrong with their kid. Um, and then there's a whole lot of information just about how to create healthy boundaries, how to support your kids to make healthy choices, how to talk about some of this stuff, which mm -hmm. is really uncomfortable. And, and we don't, maybe we as parents need to do a little learning ourselves first before we go and have a conversation with our kids. So it's really a great website and kind of the more you, you can kind of like click in to learn something and then there's usually like another level of learning if you click a little bit more and another level so like the more you want to know the more there'll be for you to know essentially um, and you can also just get like a little bit if you're feeling like I just want a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. That is so great. It's great. That yeah. is great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So about prevention messaging, did you have, did you want to speak about that a little bit, uh, the, that universal kind of approach? Sure. Well, I mean, we can talk about, so here in Vermont, um, there is the Vermont Department of Health has a number of campaigns that they've been doing for uh, quite a few years around a variety of different prevention messaging. And then I think there's hope that we'll, um, there's some new campaigns in development as well. So as part of the governor's uh, commission, there's been... Um, some support for creating a few new campaigns. Um, so that Parent Up is one of them, which is really thinking about, we've talked a lot today about tobacco and alcohol and marijuana because that tends to be where kids start. So those, and when we talk about gateway drugs, um, I don't love that term, but that those tend to be 
the three gateway drugs. There isn't necessarily one, there's kind of three that tend to lead kids towards other use. So again, the longer we can delay, the more likely that kids will never develop those, move on to the next phase, other drugs which tend to be the opiates. And, mm -hmm. um, so, the, so that is really looking at those, really the Parent Up campaign really focuses on those three things, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana. Um, and then there's some um, campaigns around prescription drug awareness that are, there's a few that are targeted at the whole state, which is the Vermont's Most Dangerous Leftovers mm -hmm. campaign. Um, and then there are a few that you'll only see as a Vermonter if, if you're in the target audience. So there's one that's um, targeted at young adults, which is really about understanding the, um, um, that uh, these prescriptions are dangerous if not used uh, as approved by a medical professional. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and they are really for young adults who may have already tried to use a, a medication and to, um, to kind of help wean people off. Um, and then there's a lot around safe uh, medication disposal and um, safe use. So there's a lot of different things that are going across yeah, our state yeah. and then there's some that are in development now. So um, I think that probably the Vermont Department of Health is the best place to get information about any of them if people but are there's interested. just so much going on on so many different mm -hmm. levels and that mm -hmm. to me is just so encouraging. Just coming at this from, from every vantage point, every angle, mm -hmm. with a sustained kind of energy, all hands on deck, mm -hmm. parents, teachers, professionals, mm -hmm. a a anybody, who, a everybody can contribute to this. I think that's one of the things that's most important. You know, you mentioned um, gateway drugs in that phrase. Mm -hmm. And when we think of gateway drugs, we think of alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. But it doesn't, gateway drugs doesn't really capture Mm -hmm. the essence of what's going on. Mm -hmm. These are dangerous psychoactive chemicals mm -hmm. known to cause addiction. Mm -hmm. Alcohol and tobacco mm -hmm. are two of the three leading causes of death, mm -hmm. preventable death on our planet. Mm -hmm. So I mean these, these things are, are, are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to somehow, without seeming like we're trying to frighten our children, mm -hmm. you know, introduce them to some of the research mm -hmm. You know some of the facts, some of the truth about these chemicals that are normalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we use language that's that's so inappropriate uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Recreational use right. mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. how can you use something recreationally mm -hmm. uh, when you're an adult, like we've been alluding mm -hmm. to? I guess you have the wherewithal and the maturity to make decisions based on rewards and consequences, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But kids, when they get these messages, mm -hmm. the take home. Yeah. Is is always kind of not quite, you know, the the reality of of the danger. Mm -hmm. It's confusing to kids. It really is. They're seeing so much on social media, yeah. And um, you know, they they their perception of harm and risk is so much lower. They don't know all the information. So I I feel like they need to be getting more information, not only in their health class, but in psychology and sociology and in their biology mm -hmm. and their civics class, you yeah. know. <coughs> and with their families, you know, really for every kid to really think of three things that make them feel good, that they like doing, or that they're good at, or they enjoy, so that they have something else that is going to give them that lift so they don't need to turn to a mind-altering substance, and also so that as a refusal skill, you know, if yeah. somebody says, hey, let's go do this, let's go get high, let's do it, they, they can say, no, let's go shoot some hoops instead. You know, yeah. why don't you come with me? Yeah. Or, or you know where I'll be. And, yeah. You know, I'm going. I'm yeah. going to go do that instead. Kids need to know what 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 fits for them. Yeah. And and basically to engage that same part of the brain. Yeah. Where there's reward. Right. Without yeah. having to ingest some kind of psychoactive chemical. Right. The natural rewards of life are, are wonderful. Yeah, and after school programs that introduce, you know, rock climbing or mountain biking mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. art or, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of other things that really help kids develop other skills. We talk about healthy risk taking, yeah. creating opportunities for healthy risk that get the same, get those endorphins going that yeah. give you that natural yeah. high. Mm -hmm. um, and, and creating those opportunities and recognizing the need to create those opportunities for kids in our communities. Yeah. We're, getting, we're getting near the end of the show. Okay. Um, I guess maybe to include adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. ACEs, toxic stress, 
like the importance of really addressing the quality of life for many of our children. Um, do you have any comments on that and maybe some of the programs that are becoming available today in Vermont for legislature mm -hmm. uh, to counteract ACEs? And one of the things that we know about adverse childhood experiences is, are that the trauma and particularly repeated trauma that hurt, happens early in childhood continues to impact our lives well into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as it, you know, from, from where I sit in a school district, what that means for us is making sure that we have supports in place um, to meet those individual student needs, but also that we have the supports in place for the larger student body. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the ways to address ACEs in a student population is creating relationship, mm -hmm. um, making sure that there's no student in a school who is not seen. Uh, and that means are there staff and faculty who not only know their name but are taking the time yeah. to really engage with them, mm -hmm. mentoring programs, mm -hmm. things like that, but really trying to meet the needs of in, not only individual students who may be in crisis, but recognizing that you're not going to know every child who's experienced mm -hmm. trauma in their life. It's just not realistic to expect that. So, so we blanket the entire population with those protective factors yeah. that you were talking about earlier. That's that's really beautiful and that's very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. That's very encouraging to me. Mm -hmm. We're just about out of time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wanted to give you each just a, a brief opportunity to mm -hmm. um, you know send a message out to the mm -hmm. general public and um, mm -hmm. you know just say what what you'd like to say to, to the viewing audience about prevention. Well um, everyone can you know, be part of this, it takes a village movement of um, really jumping on and, and helping prevent. And, um, and, and it, you know, addiction disorders can happen to anybody uh, and everybody. And so I guess I also wanted to let families know, uh, families of loved ones, um, there is Narcan available at pharmacies. Um, and anybody who has someone in their world or in their family who is using and um, is vulnerable for an overdose to make sure that they have Narcan, Narcan in, uh, which is very easy to administer. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I would, I mean, I, there's so many things I would want to say, but I would say um, I would love to see Vermont think about how we can invest in prevention. So really long-term sustainable, consistent investment in, public, in prevention. We know that um, one dollar invested in prevention saves up um, 18 to 20 dollars um, in future costs related to incarceration and mm -hmm. death and um, all the things that come as a result of substance abuse addiction. So it really does behoove us as a state to think about how we invest in prevention. And and again, you can do that as a, at a community level too. You can do that at a school district level. You can do that as a parent. What are you investing <laughs> early? Um, but, you know, thinking about how we are supporting um, sustainable prevention efforts in our community. Um, and the other thing I would say is that um, we are seeing some progress in kids like from the youth risk behavior survey results, feeling like they matter in their community. And that is a protective factor. Kids feeling like their voice matters, like they have a difference, like people are paying attention to and care about them. So as much as we can support those efforts to continue seeing that grow, Thank that you. would be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a couple of seconds left. Yeah, Go okay. Ahead. So to Mariah's point, um, I am hopeful that the conversations that are currently happening in our state do exactly what Mariah is suggesting and lead to a sustained prevention effort. Uh, and in my last couple of seconds, again, the, you know, knowing that students feel like their voices are heard, kids are not a, a problem to be solved in our community. They are an absolute asset. Um, in our communities and making sure that we are treating them as such, giving them a voice in their schools and in their communities and a place to really belong um, is, is so, so important. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can move in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Mm -hmm. and, and more importantly, thank you so much for your, your de dedication and your mm -hmm. tireless like energy in this most important uh, area, our, our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.